we'll start by talking about your career in movies, which okay. is quite a wonderful topic. And we'll start at the beginning, 1976, Lipstick. Um, <laughs> it is, for those of you who maybe don't remember or haven't seen it in a while, it's a revenge, sort of a revenge thriller. And you played a young girl, uh, played the sister of your actual sister, Margot. Yes. And um, sort of a gritty kind of gruesome uh, storyline where you're both raped and then it becomes a <laughs> sorry this is the start of our talk um, <laughs> but anyway that's, that's the premise of the movie and um, I guess so it was your actually your sister who put you up for this for this part so can yes. you talk a little bit about that uh, so she's talking about a movie called lipstick um, it, and <laughs> yes my sister thought it had never acted before so she thought because it was a pretty in-depth relationship between the two of us that she thought it would be easier if her little sister played it with her, um, which was bizarre, actually, because we, we didn't have the closest relationship, so I was kind of shocked that she recommended me to play this part. And I thought it was so exciting. I was all of 12 years old and thought it would be so great because I'll go to Los Angeles and get school clothes. <laughs> <laughs> You were in Idaho at the time. I was in yeah. Idaho. I grew up in Sun Valley, Idaho. So mm -hmm. I grew up in a small town. And did you realize or did you know uh, what the actual sub subject matter was? Or did they, did they keep that from your? I don't know that anybody actually kept it from mm -hmm. me. I knew that Margot in the, in the script was raped in the script. But I had no idea until I saw the movie with my father when I was, you know, when it came out, you know, a year later. Mm -hmm. Uh, he'd taken me to a screening in um, downtown Manhattan, like or midtown Manhattan, which is pretty like, you know, it's kind of a crazy area to be. And all these people were in the audience, and they were like, yeah, kill him, and doing all this stuff. And I sat in the audience, and I didn't realize until it happened that I was raped in the movie, too. <coughs> I, I thought that I fell down some stairs. You know, they just told me to do stuff, and I did it. So it, it was a at least it happened off screen to like handle it. I was yeah. very mad at my father. I wouldn't speak to him for for allowing you for, to do for it. allowing me to do this movie. <laughs> I was very mad at him. Um, but uh, uh, acting with your sister though, how was that? It was you know she, it was uh, it was just fun making a movie for me. It was like more of an adventure. I my scenes weren't so much with her mm -hmm. as they were with. Chris you know, Anne, Anne Bancroft mm -hmm. and Chris Sarandon, mm -hmm. both really wonderful actors. Yeah. So um, that was kind of a nice way to, to start acting. Sure. I mean, having those two as your, as your mentors yeah. is not a bad way to start. Exactly. Um, and then uh, I guess uh, you talk a little bit about this in um, Running From Crazy, but it seems like the, the trickier part happened when the reviews came out and you were praised, Margot not so much, and then you ended up getting a Golden Globe nomination. Um, sort of yeah. tricky family dynamics there. Yeah, and that's <clears throat> that's a lot to that's a lot to do with what the film is tomorrow night is that there was this I mean, you know, there's a lot of mentalism and 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 alcoholism and, and addiction and of which Margot was like fully ensconced in while making that movie. Mm -hmm. Um and and so it was difficult cuz when the movie came out, uh, my sister was slammed. It was horrifying. They were like, you know, they. She'd been a supermodel, right. made more money as a model than anybody ever had, and you know, the, the business is all about like people go up and then they just want to slam you. It's just, it's a tough, it's a tough business. So, uh, you know, they were just not kind at all, and I, I was mortified myself because I knew that it would just create so much tension, like. I knew Christmas was going to be rough. <laughs> like, oh, Christmas going to be rough As if Christmas this year. isn't hard enough with your family. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, but then from there, then you went and on to make Manhattan, which is yes. you know Tom's favorite movie of all time, but, um, and many people's favorite movie. I mean, it's, yeah. it is a certifiable American classic. Um, of course, 1979, Woody Allen, and um, you played Tracy, a high school student dating a 42-year-old neurotic, played of course by Woody Allen. Yes. Um, Once again, playing in a movie, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and how, you were 16 when you shot this. One? Uh, I was. 15 when I started and I think I turned 16 just right after it was done and um, yeah it was an it was an amazing experience just to be in New York I mean that's when I really decided I wanted to act mm -hmm. I thought wow this is so cool and working in Manhattan is just like no other experience in the world like it doesn't matter where you film a, a movie but if you get to do one actually in 
you know, Manhattan. It's just incredible. And, and he has such a, a love and passion for the city that it was just, it was just so cool. He just, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it's ironic. I actually had dinner with him about four nights ago. Huh. And I said, how come you always say it's your most unfavorite yeah, he's movie? Really he's on really it. hard on it. He goes, well, most people like it the most, so I have to, I have to break it down. <laughs> yeah. like, that's just mean. <laughs> but everyone loves Annie Hall too, and he doesn't kick Annie Hall or no. like that. But <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> um, how did that happen? I mean, you had done one movie, and then is, did Woody Allen come calling and say, "I want"? Well, I had done lipstick, and apparently, I mean, I don't know this for sure. I've never really asked him. He watched lipstick. And he Which is said, funny to imagine in itself. Yeah, and I'm <laughs> such a, you know, I mean, if you've seen it, I was 12. <laughs> Very much 12. Adorable, adorable. And maybe I shouldn't say anything more. <laughs> I mean, that's why he liked it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, I love when he stopped. I didn't. <laughs> but, uh, and then I made a, a TV movie called I Want to Keep My Baby, and he saw that as well, and I guess he was just, you know, he just thought that I could do it, which was ironic because I went to audition, whatever that meant, and I flew to, he, oh, better story. I was in Idaho, and every Friday and Saturday night, I would go to the movies there. It was called the Sun Valley Opera House. It was a very small movie theater, and I would go every single Friday and Saturday night. You paid 50 cents for the movie, and you know, you got to see both movies both nights. And the week prior, I had seen Sleeper, mm. and I and I didn't get it. <laughs> and I was young, and I was like, "Wow, this is a weird movie." You know, this guy is like rubbing this ball. I just didn't understand. And my, I got home. Um, you know, I came home from school one evening, and Woody and my mother is like freaking out. She's like, "Oh my god!" And I'm like, "What? Woody Allen is on the phone for you." And I said, who's that? <laughs> and she said, you know, you know, you saw his movie. I said, what movie? You know, you know, the one with the ball. You know, you were talking about the ball. I was like, ooh, that guy? <laughs> <laughs> so we got on the phone together, and I basically was like, hi. And he said, you know, I really liked you in your movie. I'd love for you to come out and read for my film. And I looked at my mom, I'm like, can I? <laughs> and so that was like the beginning. But um, what was very funny about the audition is I can't imagine why I got this job because I was so nervous in front of him. I had the script in front of my face so he couldn't see me. <laughs> but I got the job anyway. That's probably why. Because you, you play such a wonderful, I mean, you're adorable in the movie. You're sort of soft-spoken and, and, and naive, in, in the, especially in the context that you're the kid amongst all these you know, adults, you right. know, Diane Keaton espousing on you know, what's true art and what's yeah. not. Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Yeah, yeah, Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Um, <laughs> And, um, but it, it's, it's true, like in watching it again and scene after scene, you really are the kid. Did you feel that? Did you feel like the youngster on the set? <clears throat> or were you I more think I always of... felt young. I didn't know anything different. I, spe I spent a lot of time with adults growing up where I did. And I, you know, it was a, it was a small community, but, it was, but I spent a lot of time with my parents. But I think with um, Manhattan, I didn't feel, I mean, he wanted me to feel sophisticated, mm -hmm. so he made me feel like I was smart, you know, to, told me about museums and things, so I thought I was all incredibly intelligent by, you know, by the time, still didn't know what I was doing in the <laughs> film, and asked my mother, how do I kiss him in the movie, in, in this scene where I'm supposed to kiss him? And she goes, don't ask me that. <laughs> so I, I'm like, who am I supposed to ask? So I sat in front of the mirror kissing my arm, trying to see if I looked OK. <laughs> so. did, you, did it give you pause at, at 14 or 15 that you were going to kiss 40 or 2 year old or however old he was, Woody Allen? I have to tell you, I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. That wasn't, I probably should have, but it wasn't, it wasn't my, it wasn't a, a, an issue. I was just more nervous that, you know, like I was, I was such a kid, but mm -hmm. I just pretended I wasn't. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I really know what's going on. 
And of course, you were nominated for an Oscar for this one. I was. I didn't even know what that meant either. Really? Yeah. And I dressed up like a bride and took a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I wore a white dress and it was Scott Glenn. And apparently, years later, his wife told me that she was really mad because I looked like I was marrying a child <laughs> bride. <laughs> like, oh. Scott Glenn's child bride. <laughs> yeah. um, do you remember when you found out about the nomination? What, what you. Well, was it a surprise? Uh, it was completely a surprise. And everybody, it, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot Will of. She won't she, yeah. Energy and mm -hmm. publicity, and and they sent me to uh, the Cannes Film Festival, and if anybody's been there or mm -hmm. knows anything about it, it's pretty intense. I mean, really intense. There's just like you go it, when you do your premiere, you go up these stairs. They're you know Black red tie. carpeted stairs, and you're all dressed up, and they take a billion, you know, like that whole picture thing that was going on, but. Thou like a sea of thousands of people with pictures and they're just snapping your picture. Marielle, 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 Marielle in French. And I was so undone that I got into the film, I tried to watch the film, my heart was beating, I was with my father, and I looked at him at one point and I had a total panic attack and they had to take me out the back way. Because oh. I kept thinking, I can't go do that again. It was so, I thought that was the scariest thing ever. Mm -hmm. I was never very good at like the whole like well, red carpet. At that age. And, yeah, I was you know. completely overwhelmed. I didn't know what was going on. I mean, it was a fun ride, but you know, you wish you'd know then what you know now and you would have like done something about it, but I didn't <laughs> right. know. And it's different, you know, uh, what's interesting now is that Hollywood is such a machine and, and kids become stars overnight mm -hmm. and they have teams of people that dress them and do PR. Do, you know, I had none of that. Nobody was telling me what to wear mm -hmm. or how to pose or do anything. So you, you, you find out, you know, you find out by falling down, basically, which is what I did. <laughs> <laughs> but not on the red carpet steps, thankfully. Well, <laughs> almost. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not, it wasn't the age of TMZ. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I would imagine that your life changed significantly after you know being in a Woody Allen movie, one that was so well received, getting an Oscar nomination, going to Cannes. I mean, do you remember what? I mean, you talked about it just now, but like the the aftermath of when it came out and this the whirlwind. And did you have more? And more I was offers? making. I was actually making another movie at the time. What was I making? I was making Personal, Personal Best. Best yeah. So um, I was fully in. I was fully into that. So I was out in L.A. and I was training. Mm -hmm. I had grown up an athlete. I was was, uh, I was basically a ski racer until I was 16 and I decided I was going to move to New York and be an actress. Um, so I was always an athlete and I really wanted to make that movie because I wanted you know, that to happen. So I think that was actually kind of nice to have mm -hmm. a cushion mm -hmm. between this movie and doing something else was very helpful because mm -hmm. I don't know that, you know, sitting around like watching yourself in public it, is odd. It's hard to grow up in a fishbowl, mm -hmm. you know, because you think that you're supposed to do it a certain way. Yeah. Or, yeah. So it was nice to have personal best to just put myself into, although I trained way too long and hard <laughs> for it. And it went on and there was a actor strike, so we so I trained for a year prior to making the movie, learning how to hurdle, which scared me, and I had to keep doing it for and it started when I was 17, it didn't come out until I was 21. Right, cuz it was 3 yeah. years after. Yeah. Right, cuz so there was a strike in the yeah. middle, which and you just kept training the whole time. I kept time. having to train. I was like, I'm <clears throat> never going to stop hurdling. You should have just I gone to the actual Olympics. Yeah. Exactly. Like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, well, that's a perfect segue cuz I was going to ask you about that and I had read that you trained for a year, um, but it sounds like it was actually even more than that. Yeah. Um, and having been an athlete and grown up, you know, very outdoorsy and athletic, but this seems like it was on a different level. And also, I mean, track and field, I mean, doing those sorts of things, and especially playing opposite an actual professional athlete. Mm -hmm. um, was that part of the appeal? Was it daunting? Was it just... I really wanted to be in the film because I, I loved being an athlete. I grew up in an athletic home and, I, and you know, being, being outdoors and working out was really an important part of my life. Mm -hmm. And I liked the idea of doing something that I hadn't done before and trying to be, trying to at least look 
like I could do it. And I did every, you know, I did everything. They just had to slow everything down. <laughs> it's like, sorry, I get to win the race. You got to slow down. It looks, it looks very realistic. It and does. Your legs, your long legs are going over the hurdles. But the, I mean, they were all athletes, all these female athletes, and they were such, ex and they were fast and, you know, they were really strong. And I was strong, but I was slow. I was so <laughs> slow. They would be like, are you going to get here? Really, they'd be like doing this, and I'm, I think I'm running so fast it was very funny <laughs> um, so uh, for those who don't remember um, personal, personal best. best was 1982 directed by Robert Town and um, she played Muriel played Chris a track and field star who's sort of juggling relationships with a man and a woman and um, which is interesting especially at that time period to have a movie you know in 1982 that dealt very openly with you know gay and bisexual and by curious people was that um, also part of the appeal. I mean, it was kind of groundbreaking in that respect. Again, I think I was the most naive. <laughs> <laughs> it's like trial by fire. For I Mary was Ellen. like, I liked that movie. I thought it was fine to. I, I never judged those things. I thought it was a job, and and you know, and it was really interesting. But I remember there, there was a big uh, uh, press conference at the end of the movie. The movie finally came out. I'm, you know, and then, Mary Ellen, Mary, Mary, well, what was it like to play a lesbian? And I looked out and I went, I didn't play a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> and I think a lot of my <clears throat> lesbian fans were a little bit bummed that I like just right. did some. Because I didn't see it that way. I saw it as somebody who was just, you know, experimenting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was, I was a very does. naive. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, no. um, well, it was. I mean, it was also. I guess you had started it right when Manhattan was kind of finishing up um, in terms of it being released and everything. But it is. Um, you're much more grown up in that movie, and maybe it. Um, it isn't actually three years, you know, from when it when you shot it to when right. it came out. But um, you know, going from playing this sort of sweet, soft-spoken high school student to you know this character was that was that a intentional choice to, to sort of, or did you see it that way at the time? It's sort of like this is more, and especially having started when you were so, so young, it's often hard to navigate becoming well, an I adult. I think that when you, I think any actor, it, it, I think their life will kind of mirror, or their, excuse me, their characters will mirror their life mm -hmm. in some way. Not necessarily, like sometimes it's just a seed that you, that you go, oh, I, I can see a little bit of this in me, and then you, you know, then you, it, it, it's enhanced. So I think that, you know, there was a part of me that was, you know, searching, not feeling secure about herself. I mean, there was certainly mm -hmm. that. So those, those same emotional feelings were there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's why people liked me in that way that there was a naturalness that seemed like mm -hmm. I was always that person. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, you know, anybody who's like in tune with a character just because, you know, you, you, you don't see the lines of differentiation. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's interesting because, you know, you really did sort of just fall into acting. I mean, at yeah. what point did you, had it, was it something that you, Prior to Margot suggesting you join her in lipstick, did you um, think about it when you were a actually? Little girl? I did. I had played um, Barbara. You'll find this funny. I, I don't know if I told you this. Barbara, the director of Running from Crazy, is in the audience, and she's amazing, an amazing, amazing woman. Um, but I, uh, I had played in in the Children's Hour oh. <laughs> when I was. 13 mm -hmm. on this stage and we just showed running from crazy on this in the same Sun Valley Opera House that I talked about that I went to see sleeper um, <laughs> and so it was cool. yeah there's all these little things but uh, so I liked acting there was like this secret thing because I was a very super shy kid and I think a lot of actors sort of are that way I think you'll find that mm -hmm. like a lot of even big actors will start out super shy super like quiet and they don't want but then a character gives them the ability to be bigger and bolder and express themselves in the way that they couldn't do. And especially with my upbringing, I didn't feel safe to do that at home, but it was like, wow, with acting, I find a family, mm -hmm. I could speak out, I could be somebody and kind of hide behind that and not, and, and, and not deal with my mm -hmm. own fears or mm -hmm. insecurities. And also being the, the youngest of, in, a, in a family of very sort of volatile and 
vociferous sisters, um, yeah. it, must, it must have been nice to kind of just forge your own path and yeah, I think so. And have your voice in a different arena. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, there's one thing I wanted to just hop back to Manhattan. I mean, I, I, as I said, and I'm sure everybody who's seen it knows, I mean, it is such a wonderful movie and it is so beloved. Um, is, what, when people see you and come up to you, do, they, do they, they most often talk about Manhattan or what do they want to talk about? It depends on where I am. Mm -hmm. If I'm in India, they like Superman 4. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why anybody would like Superman 4, but... There are, Superman, there are Superman fans that don't care that it was the worst movie ever made. But um, uh, uh, no, most people like on the East Coast, it's such a, you know, and I'll find what's really great is like people that my daughter's age, and I have a 23-year-old and a 25-year-old, they'll, they'll come up and be like, oh my god, I just saw that movie, it's amazing, you're amazing, whatever. There's something about that film mm -hmm that touches people at a level because it really is a piece of, it, you know, it's, an, it's a piece of art. It's black and white, it's shot so beautifully, it's Gershwin, it's, mm -hmm. oh, and another funny story, I thought the music that was behind every time I came on was written for me. <laughs> <laughs> know that Gershwin was around before then. <laughs> I have no idea. It's naive. <laughs> But that's kind of nice, you know? It, it gets you in the spirit of, the, of, of Tracy. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and did you did you have any sense at the time that I mean you had only made well, I guess one other movie and then the and then the TV movie did you have any sense and I, I think I probably know what you're going to say but that, that you were going <laughs> that you were making what would become such a classic oh I had no idea yeah. nobody does you never yeah. know I mean you do sense that something kind of cool is happening mm -hmm. though you know you're making something black and white that nobody did very much that yeah in fact nobody did. You know, Raging Bull was after that, mm -hmm. so nobody was doing that. Right. Gordy Willis, who was the cinematographer, was extraordinary, and he would spend hours just tweaking a light in such a way to get a perfect, you know, collage and something, mm -hmm. and the sky had to be a certain way, and it it was you knew something was going on. I mean, you didn't think, mm -hmm. it, I didn't think it was gonna be the classic that it became, but you knew there was, so, you mm -hmm. got a sense that something special was happening. Mm -hmm. And Woody is famous for not giving a lot of direction and just sort of saying, that's fine, let's, let's move on. I mean, was that your experience and how was that? He, know, was, and, he was actually, <clears throat> I think because I was so young and I really was, I really didn't know what to do. He was. He never told me what to do. There was a lot of improv, mm -hmm. and um, he worked with Diane a lot on that part because mm -hmm. Diane was actually struggling with this part, and he he wanted something particular that he wasn't getting from her. Mm -hmm. And because they'd been together for so many years, they had sort of a, an unspoken dialogue. And 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 but he was he was actually more than anybody I'd ever seen him work with. He was like really talking to her and mm -hmm. trying to get it out. He never really talked to me about my performance at all. <laughs> Just like, do this, say that, hug me here. You know? Well, the Oscar nomination speaks for itself. Yeah, well, so. there we go. That was an, that was kind of an amazing scene. Just that, mm. you know, the 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 soda fountain scene. Yeah. Because um, I remember being very nervous about it, and I knew that it had weight to it. I knew mm. that scene had weight to it, but I wasn't even sure how much. And it just, you know, when something's right and you're just in the right space at the right time, it just comes out. And it was, and was it, it was a, powerful. A it lot just of came takes out. Or just no. one take? One, one takes. Take. Yeah. Really, one take? Yeah. Wow. That, that didn't ever happen again. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so we did personal best. We'll move on to Star 80, which was 1983, and Bob Fosse directed that one. And here you played Doria, excuse me, Dorothy Stratton, the Playboy Bunny who was murdered by her husband manager. There's some darkness in your filmography. Um, yeah. um, so what do you remember about what drew you to this one? Working with Bob Fosse. I well, working with Bob Fosse was pretty incredible. Because he was a, you know, he was a choreographer first for Broadway. So all the entire movie, he, when we started, um, when we started, we rehearsed it. Those are back in the days where people actually rehearsed their movies. It was great. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they do that somewhere. But it was really beautiful. We had six weeks of rehearsal. And he taped out on a stage bigger than this, obviously. He taped out every single room that, that we were supposed to be in. Here's your home, your childhood home. Here's, 
you know, the house that you have with Paul Snyder, here's this, here's that, here's the restaurant. And by the end of six weeks, he took a stopwatch and he would say, okay, one, two, three, start the movie. And we'd go through every single scene as though it was a play. Hmm. And even the scenes where I was um, posing mm -hmm. for Playboy, I did all of them and he choreographed all of those like a dance. So it, I, it was such an honor for me because as you can see, I'm really long and I was a bit gawky at the time. <laughs> so for me to be you know, directed by somebody who was a choreographer and you know, he treated me like a dancer in some ways, I, was, I thought it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. But it was, I learned more about what it takes to really profoundly get into a character and really act. Um, because once you've done some, something that many times and it's like, it, it, it's like in your cells. You don't so have rehearsing. to think about it anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that you've been boring, you've been over the top, you've, done, you've mm -hmm. done it all a million different ways. So by the time you go to shoot it, you never, you're never thinking about the lines, you already know them. And it becomes new again. So mm -hmm. it was after all that time, it was like new every time we would shoot. But it was a, it was a tough film and I think it affected me more than any film that I ever did mm. because it really, it got under my skin and I think there was an element of playing this victim character mm -hmm. that I related to too much. Mm. And it kind of, it, 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 it had a disturbing effect on me personally for a lot of years <laughs> afterwards. How come you, why do you think you related to the victim mentality? Well, it's another reason you should go see the movie. <laughs> you should see the movie tomorrow night. See um, how I did that? <laughs> um, I just, you know, I come from, I, I come from insecurity. I, you know, I come from great creativity, but I also come from tremendous, you know, alcohol abuse and, and a, tr a lot of pain and a lot of mm -hmm. trying to push the pain away with alcohol, with drugs, with, with not talking about something, with, you know, there was just dysfunction, like everybody. <laughs> uh, but I, a and I was very quiet and I didn't say a lot, you know, or if I did, you get in trouble. You know, it was back in the days, like, don't talk back <laughs> if you say anything. Mm. Um, so, so I felt, even though I wasn't victimized, I wasn't abused in that kind of way, but I felt there was, a, there was an element of being tentative, mm -hmm. a little bit scared. So I could relate to that. Mm -hmm. I could relate to, you know, even though it was, she was playing a playmate, but she became quite a big star very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that kind of happened to me. So I had a relationship with that. And, and there's an mm -hmm. unknown factor. There's an element of, and she was a people pleaser. And mm -hmm. I was very much that mm -hmm. when I was a kid. I very mm -hmm. much didn't want anybody to dislike me. Right. And, and she was the same way. Mm -hmm. So I think that though, th there were, too many elements that were too much alike, that that's why I resonated with her mm -hmm. so much. Um, so, I mean, you, it, it's also an interesting sort of when you're going back and looking at your filmography because of the progression, again, having started so young, you know, you have all of these stages, and this one is sort of the most overtly sexual um, until that point. Right. And I think this is, this is the one where you did your first nude scene, right? I think so. <clears throat> no. Um, no. 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 <laughs> Personal best. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes. I forgot about that. I'm sorry. Oh, you forget. I don't know how I forgot My that. My daughters <clears throat> pointed it out not long ago. Yes. <laughs> Personal I best. I was like, I wasn't nude in that. And they said, look at this. I was like, oh, gosh. <laughs> I think I was thinking so much, though. Yeah, no, I funny. know. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. So, that's what I thought. Um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, <laughs> was it, um, did, when you're doing it, I mean, do you see this, I mean, you, you answered a little bit already about sort of how things mirror your life, but um, was it, uh, I mean, when you, when you go into a movie like this and it, did it help sort of doing, I, I mean, every actor I've ever spoken to has always said nude scenes are never the easiest thing to do. But when you had six months of rehearsals and you have someone like Bob Fosse who's, who's choreographing it, I mean, is that, does that help? I would imagine it would make it a lot more and a closed set, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, a really closed set. Yeah, it's never easy. It's uncomfortable. You're just, it just feels, you know, it's bad enough. You're like, you know, you're private and public with your emotions. To be yeah. private and public with your body is, is, mm. 
it's uncomfortable at mm-hmm. best. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's just never. Especially in a, in a context of this, this dark like this is. I mean, she's exactly. a victim. Exactly. I mean, I never, happy... I, I don't like gratuitous nudity mm-hmm. in a film for no reason whatsoever. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And now, of course, now it's just kind of like par for the course. No, nobody seems to care. It's mm-hmm. like nudity is just the thing. It's on television. So. And, um, but I remember at the time, it was, you know, I, and for somebody who was, you know, I had very low self-esteem, so you're, you're constantly like, you know, looking and mm. wonder, you know, and you're wondering if they're looking at you, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's uncomfortable. No, it's, yeah. it's a tough thing. I mean, I think, uh, you know, lay people, when you, you, we lay people, when you think about it, you're just kind of like, how do they do that? But right. That's one of the many questions we wonder yeah. about the, the, the mystery of acting. Um, well, Eric Roberts, who plays your um, your stalker, murderous um, husband and uh, estranged husband and, and manager, he and eventually becomes your character's killer. Um, does did he's so intense and crazy and scary in the movie? And I would imagine, like having had six months of rehearsal of that, I mean, that must have been really, really intense. I mean, do you do you get used to it at a certain point, or is it is it just sort of like here comes Mad Dog Eric Roberts on set? <laughs> Well, actually, for the six weeks that we rehearsed, he was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. He was easy. He was, we got along great. Then he asked me to go out uh-huh. <laughs> at the very end. And I said, oh, man. I said, we're having such a good time. I just don't think it's a good idea. Mm. And he didn't like me after that. <laughs> he wasn't happy with me. Oh, well, but I think, I think, ego. honestly, it was more about, I really think that he, you know, he was he got twisted enough to get inside the the head of this character who was not a good guy. And although Bob was often frustrated with 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 Eric, you know, like frustrated, like ah, mm-hmm. oh, he's driving me crazy. But it was the kind of driving him crazy that was the kind of performance that he got. And it's a don. I mean, that movie is it is heavy. Yeah. It's dark. It's heavy. It's it's great, but it's it's not easy to watch. And mm-hmm. I think it would when we went to the premiere, the like, people were just like, it wasn't like, woohoo, gut, gut punch. You know? yeah. like, <clears throat> oh wow, that's a rough film. Yeah, and those are hard too because you you I mean when they're good as this one is, I mean you you want to as a as a audience member you want to recommend them, and then sort of the, the, you add that caveat of like, well. Don't go when you're feeling down. Oh, yeah, don't go right, yeah. when, if you're having, when you're feeling up. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> you won't afterwards. <laughs> right. Right. Um, well, so that was '83, I believe, and then um, I think you got married the following year. '84. '84. Yes. And and it's interesting because you know having when you you started in the '70s is sort of like the the prime era of the auteur era, and you had you worked with these amazing directors. Um, and then, you know, the 80s came around and the, big, the studio system, the movies are getting bigger and it was sort of, you know, right smack in the middle of the blockbuster age. I mean, did you feel that movies were changing and the roles for you were changing? I d- uh, yeah, I did. It was, it was a tougher time mm-hmm. and, you know, nobody prepares you how to deal with, with the business. I mean, the, you know, actors are... Their very nature is to be sensitive mm-hmm. and, uh, and and probably insecure because that makes you more moldable. You know, you're like better. You can absorb a character. You can become something. But you're not prepared to be rejected that much. <laughs> you know, it's tough. It makes it more difficult. And it was. It was like it was just starting then mm-hmm. to be about all huge big blockbusters right. and you know and and. And box office was a big deal, and it hadn't been before. Right. It was more. You're right. It, it really there was a shift, and um, it, it was hard to understand because mm-hmm. I'd never had to audition. Really, I mean, Woody Allen's audition probably doesn't count <laughs> with script and yeah, with face. script and face. <laughs> I couldn't get away with that anymore. So I think it was a different. Yeah, it was definitely a different time. And I got married, and I had children mm-hmm, right away. Mm-hmm. And I chose to be a mom. I thought that was really super important. So I focused my life on being a mom, mm-hmm. you know. And I thought because of how I'd been brought up, and again, you got to see the movie. <laughs> um, I I really wanted to be there for them. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to be a mom who wasn't there right. or or you know not present. And you were in L.A. or or in Idaho I was or all over. I mean, mm-hmm. I did I did projects. Mm-hmm. I did movies. You know, yeah, no, I, I made movies, and I you know <clears throat> did a television show. I did. A, a television show called Civil Wars mm-hmm. that was mm-hmm. 
would, I played a lawyer, a, you know, a civil attorney, a, 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 a divorce attorney. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I did stuff, but I, I really pared it down. I really focused on being a mom and didn't, like, mm -hmm. push myself into projects mm -hmm. um, the same kind of way. Right. I worked all the time. Right. But when I say all the time, I mean I made up one or two projects a year. I Which tried to keep it pretty... Pretty steady. I mean, yeah. Pretty, pretty good. You know, pretty good. I think it's, I mean, to be a working actor and to make, a, you yeah, know, to keep going. I, it was hard for me kids. to decide to do television because that was back when nobody did TV. Right. You know, right. it's, it's like, not like it's now. Not, no, right. now everybody's yeah. like begs to get a television right. job. You're like, yeah, the best roles are on television. Especially <laughs> they really for are, women. especially for women, yeah. and especially women who are over, you know, twenty. Exactly. You know, like, it's not even wow. over thirty-five anymore. It's no, like, it's oh, like you're twenty. You're <laughs> old. It's true. Um, so you can get you can get characters that just have just depth and meaning and and stuff and you know filmmaking is a very tricky tr tricky business you mm -hmm. know to find things that speak to you and speak to your heart and sometimes mm -hmm. people don't see them like I did I did a bunch of films that I was so crazy about and they were fun and mm -hmm. you know four people saw them. Right. No it's true and I think that is also you know I mean every actor even you know the biggest actors around have those on their filmographies. Um, yeah. Well you had mentioned this before <clears throat> the favorite movie of um, all of your fans in India, um, <laughs> Superman for the quest for peace. Um, what it wasn't a critical success ne necessarily, um, but you did get to work with Christopher Reeve. I did, and his last incarnation as Superman. Yes. Um, other than <laughs> not being such a fan yourself of the movie, right? Um, what do you remember about the experience? He was. I mean, making the film was so much fun. I, it couldn't have been better. We were in London. It was a great studio. It was a big movie. You know. When you have movies like that, and I'd never been, I don't think I'd ever been in that kind of blockbuster yeah. kind of movie where they have so much money that, you know, and we were at Pinewood Studio, mm -hmm. yeah, Pinewood mm -hmm. Studios, and it was incredible. I was in London, and I thought it was great, and they were they had me up on wires half the day. Mm -hmm. I, I had a good time. I wore those big 80s shoulder pads. <laughs> I was awesome, big hair. It was super fun. Um, and and Chris was a really kind yeah. and loving guy. Yeah. He was a really good human being. Mm -hmm. um, he was just so not what you'd expect Superman to be. Right. He was just a good. He was a really kind man. And the other person who was wonderful was um, Gene Hackman. Hackman yeah. He was incredible. I mean, it was such a crazy role, but he was he was wonderful. And at the time, he really wanted to make my grandfather's book Across the River and Into the Trees. Hmm. And we discussed doing that. And for some reason, it fell apart. But he he was a, he talk about an interesting actor. I'm sure he would have had an interesting take on it, too. He's such yeah. a smart guy and I incredible, such a great actor. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you've 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 just it's so interesting to go back and, and talk about this stuff. I mean, the people you've worked with, I mean, it's sort of like Actors now would just salivate over the people that you know, Anne Bancroft in your first I know, movie. Right. You know. I know, <laughs> I know. I know. And even in a Superman movie, it's still Gene Hackman. You know, I know so. exactly. Um, That's what I kept saying to myself. <clears throat> <laughs> well, at least I work with Gene. Hackman. <laughs> <laughs> did you believe? Uh, sort of conversely, what to to Manhattan? Um, did you have a sense that maybe this one was not going to be? Light the world on fire, uh, Superman. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Was it a mess? <laughs> Pretty much. Oh, oh, Superman four when it came out? No, no, no. When, oh. During making it, did you? Did oh it... yeah. I mean, when you saw Nuclear Man, <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't even put a sentence together. He was super nice, but it was like, <laughs> wow, you can't even speak. Um... Like, you're big. <laughs> They didn't have to do anything to him. He just was that way. Yeah. <laughs> he looked like he was kind of nuclear and on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I think they released, uh, I haven't seen that version, and I admit I haven't seen the movie since it came out when I was in middle school. But um, uh, I think I, that they released a new cut um, for all of those you know, geeky, diehard yeah. purists with a, an expanded role for your character. Wow. Yeah. So. <laughs> Lucky me. Yes. <laughs> no. Can't wait Cutting to go back. Room floor no longer. Actually, what's really funny <clears throat> is that as you get older, you don't care. Like something comes out that you're younger, you know, print, print, you think prettier, your skin looks good. You're like, I don't care. It was awesome. <laughs> I look awesome. Like, look at those clothes. Yeah. <laughs>
Do you ever watch any of your, your movies if you're You know what? Around? I never, ever, when, at, at the time, I, I really have a hard time. And Barbara's so funny because she, she goes to all the screenings. She goes, why don't you want to stay and watch the movie? I'm like, oh, my God. It was torture the first time. I can't, I mean, for me, it's really hard to, it's just hard to watch yourself. Mm. It's now, you know, watching Manhattan, I'm not watching me, I'm watching a little girl, you know, yeah. I'm watching this young girl. And it's really interesting perspective because I'm like, oh, that was me. And and so I can look at things in perspective that, that I have distance from, but boy, anything close to me now, it's just, it's hard. Yeah. It, you know, you, you need some distance, some space. <laughs> but, you, but, but some actors that I've spoken with over the years, like they don't watch their films. Like Joaquin Phoenix is just like, I do not, so he says. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, he's never seen any of his movies. I mean, you didn't. You don't go that far. You watch. I it. yeah. I watch. I think I watch him once, and mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And then you're just like, okay, okay, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't seen any of my early films until my daughters got wind of you know when they were like in high school mm -hmm. and they were watching some of the movies and with their like, friends hey, mom and did stuff. This. Yeah. yeah, came home and said I was a porn star. My <laughs> friends say you're a porn star. I am? <laughs> you're in this movie. They're very religious. They think you're a porn star. It's like, not quite, not quite. <laughs> so tell them, yeah. No, I'm okay. like, it was the 80s. <laughs> it was the 80s. I'm like, no, it wasn't. <laughs> I tried to explain what porn was versus just being naked. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. like, it was artistic. There's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> there is. There is. Um, well, there you, is. You, you talked a little bit about this. I mean, over the years, you, you kept working. You did a number of miniseries, movies, and TV shows. I mean, you really were working very steadily. There are no gaps in your, in your um, filmography. But, and then one of the um, most, to, to my mind anyway, interesting um, stints that you did was on Roseanne. Ah, in 1994 yes. and um, here we're back to the lesbian word because you <laughs> played a lesbian who famously kissed Roseanne and I think you only did two episodes but that episode yes. was so controversial and they of course aired it during sweeps and it was intentionally yeah. they knew what they were doing um, but there were um, protests and people insisting that ABC not air the episode. I mean, do you, do you remember? Were you kind of, uh, did, did you feel like I think you... I must have liked stuff like that, because I <laughs> tended to do that. Yeah. You know, like, get involved in something. Um, I just thought, you know, I got the call mm -hmm. to be on Roseanne. She was a huge success at the time. And I actually, yeah. um, I, wore, I did a play with John Goodman in Dallas, Texas once before he was a star and he was all depressed because he thought he was never gonna be a star. I was like, John, no, you're really talented. You're gonna, I think you're gonna do well thinking, I don't know. And then, you know, two then years he's later, he's just like, on the biggest show ever and, yeah. you know. So I really thought it would be fun. I never think about the outcome. Like, I, I never thought, oh, this is very controversial. I should do this. I just think, wow, Interesting. how incredible mm -hmm. to work with these people who were so, like, out there and doing, you know, she was the biggest thing on television mm -hmm. at the time. And, and I really, you know, I, I was curious. And I thought, yeah, sure, I'll show up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had one scene. I was like, I looked at her and gave her, like, one of these <laughs> and planted a kiss on her. And she had the best reaction. She was like, <laughs> No, I was like, oh. That's not on camera, though, I don't no. think. Yeah. I think she did. Yeah, I guess that was a now take. <laughs> I think that was a now take. It is on YouTube. I just watched it again today. It's oh, great. you did? It's funny. <laughs> it's, 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 you just really are transported back to 1994 and the cameras, right. the way it looks and the hairstyles and that show and the era. I mean, <laughs> right. television is such a time capsule. So um, do you remember the controversy? Were you sort of, <clears> just, I mean, you'd done your scene and then were you over it or do you remember? I did a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't, you know, I didn't focus on it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't concerned. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing, like, that people were upset, and I thought it was funny, yeah. And whatever. Yeah. I you think know. Roseanne even said that, you know, if, if um, ABC didn't air the episode, she, I mean, she had so much power at that point. She yeah, she take did. take her show somewhere else. Yeah. So, you know, good for her. Um, uh, and so then, just jumping ahead a little bit <clears throat> to de Deconstructing Harry, um, you know, an ensemble movie, but what was it like to, to reunite with Woody? Well, I met with Woody and I said, you know, I really want to work with you. And he told me the other night when I saw him, he goes, I 
didn't give you a very good role. <laughs> I was like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. After all those years, I come back and I yell at you in a parking lot. <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun to, you know, be there and work with him again. And I, it's uh, the one time I can say that I worked with Robin Williams, although he was out of focus. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> <it> was, <laughs> the whole movie was out of focus. I mean, it was such an, I love, Woody is so brave because he he may, he's so willing to make a big mistake, mm -hmm. you know, or try something that will just be crazy that people don't understand or something. But he ha I mean, that's the sign of a true artist is when they just go down a road and they just really they commit fully. And whether or not it's, you know, you know, sometimes there are periods of artists' lives that are just they don't. They don't work so well, but he's coming back like gangbusters oh, and yeah. doing such amazing, oh, yeah. amazing, amazing work still. Yeah. He went to Europe, sort of got rejuvenated, and now he's back. Yeah, he's all here, about so. Europe now. No, he's, I think yeah. this one, the one that's coming out this summer, he's back here. So Alec Baldwin and... Kate Blanchett. Yes, Kate Blanchett. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But the next one he's doing now is in the south of France. Uh-huh. He's back in Europe. <laughs> so you can, it can give you a part again? Going to go back in that? Uh, not, not in this one. <laughs> Not in this way. He already cast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be fun. In a heartbeat. Yeah, yeah. In a heartbeat. Anybody. Anybody does. Um. Well, I guess we could segue now a little bit into um, <clears throat> just your your current work and what's really kind of um, your passion now, which is um, you know, in addition to being a mother to two daughters, which you <laughs> talked about, um, at a certain point you really started devoting yourself more to to sort of to use a general term to wellness and yeah. and. Um, and health and, and, and fitness. And if you could just talk a little bit about your philosophy about you know, your, your particular brand of, of what that is. Well, I mean, it, 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 <clears throat> it really, I sort of have to speak about Running From Crazy, which is this film that I did with Barbara, or that Barbara did on my, me and my family, and, and my journey to understand the mental illness that I come from and the challenges of my family and the, di the addiction, alcoholism, and drug abuse. and you know, manic depression and suic and seven suicides. I come from seven suicides. And um, I was really, it's called running from crazy because that's exactly what I felt like I was doing my whole life was running from crazy. I felt like, you know, I, my eldest sister who's in the film, who's so beautiful and just such a sweetheart is schizophrenic, bipolar, manic depressive, the whole nine yards. And because of that, there was always a sense like, oh my gosh, when, you know, what if I wake up one day and I'm crazy and I've got two kids and I won't even know that I'm crazy and you know, I won't parent well. You know, my whole life is just like always scared, basically. So instead of like my sister who was in pain and, and not understanding why she was the way she was or why she was in pain. Joan or Margot? That was Margot mm -hmm. and, and, and Muffet as well. Mm -hmm. Muffet did a ton of drugs, mm -hmm. which I think triggered a, <clears throat> an, you know, a genetic predisposition mm -hmm. for, for these problems because my grandfather suffered from manic depression as well. Um, so I, I was always afraid. I was, but so what I did instead of going in, instead of going into addiction to that, I, I became addicted to health and mm -hmm. wellness and mm -hmm. exercise and food. And but I was I was a little crazy. <laughs> like, I mean, my crazy was in that I was obsessive. Mm -hmm. You know, I ate every way. I was you know vegan. I was macrobiotic. I was all raw, stinky year. Ooh, that was bad. <laughs> um, you know, I was everything. But I did it with a vengeance. You know and I would count calories or I would, you know, whatever it was that was out there, high fat, low fat, no fat, high protein, you know, whatever it was, I was doing it. And, and then I was exercising for hours. You know, sometimes my, my ex-husband talks about it in the film that I would mm -hmm. jump rope for like an hour and a half until Jeez. I was cold. I went from being hot to cold. It was just, you know, I was, that was how I got out of pain. That's how I tried to control everything in my life. If I could control everything, I'd be okay. Um, and uh, obviously that wasn't working so well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what it did do is that it was a lot of years of self of like introspection, really trying to figure myself out and following gurus and doing this and that. I was always reaching outside myself to find the answers for me. And it wasn't too long ago that I really discovered with my, my life partner now, Bobby Williams, and we have a 
we have a company called The Willing Way, and we have a book called The Willing Way. And that I oh, realized no. <laughs> that my, yeah, his last name, Williams Hemingway, The Willing Way. Um, I realized that the answers were in me, and that I had all the answers for me. I knew I was my best guru, my best nutritionist, my best therapist, my best trainer, my best this, that, and the other thing. I didn't need to reach out to gurus and doctors and this and that. That I really needed to get quiet and still. And so we created a philosophy together because he's very much about health and wellness as well. And through our mutual love of the outdoors and we're very connected in nature. I mean, we're so happy we woke up this morning and mm. that beautiful ocean and the wind and, you know, it was just like, it was magical and we connect in that way. And so we, we combined our philosophies of really finding balance through the food that you eat, whether you drink water, whether you take silence, whether you get outside in nature, you know, the thoughts that you think and whether you sleep simple, super simple things that make your life better, make you healthier, make you more balanced, you know, bring, bring simplicity to your life and it actually is healing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for Bobby, it's not about mental balance, but for me, it really, it, it, it I got more still, I got more, I, I, I have inner peace, I actually feel you know, I, it, it, we talk about my career and I think back and I'm, always, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I was so insecure. I just mm. was trying so hard to please everybody. And I can honestly see, say now, 51 years old, I love myself. And I could never have said that before. I could never have said I actually like me. I thought that was like a stupid and embarrassing thing <laughs> to say. Like, oh, that's like weird and arrogant. <laughs> But I actually realized that self-love is just a way, it, it's just the most pure and, and powerful thing that you can find for yourself. It's the most healing thing that you can do for yourself on so many levels. And I'm not saying it's the end, you know, that our philosophy in the willing way is the end all answer for everything, but it's a piece of finding balance, whether it's mental, physical, emotional, that is missing in the in the dialogue or this conversation mm -hmm. that we might be having about wellness. Wellness is everything you do. And that's what our philosophy is about, is because I've had so much experience feeling horrible about myself or, or being insecure, or not feeling well, or being depressed all of my life until I wasn't, that these things are, these simple things in nature actually help make you a more healthy, happy person. Mm -hmm. And running from crazy is just such a, a an amazing catalyst, such an amazing, like, it was such a healer for me. I actually, you know, I agreed to do the film and sort of was like, uh, do I really want to do a film about me? Because my, my best friend who was working at the OWN Network, because Oprah Winfrey is an executive producer of this film, she said, you've got to tell us the story about your, your life and your family. And I said, why? My family's crazy. Ooh, exactly. <laughs> and that's exactly what she said. Lisa said, exactly. Mm. And she was right. Um, but it wasn't until she said that Barbara was going to be the director that I went, oh, well, maybe I'm more interested. Barbara's a filmmaker. She's not a reality show maker. Right. She is a filmmaker. She is two-time Academy Award winning filmmaker. And I thought, wow, that changes the dialogue. That mm -hmm. changes the atmosphere that this can be made. You know, I thought, wow, this is incredible. So we met and we fell in love with each other. And, and she said, you know, I'll, I'll do this and I'll do this right. And I was, I agreed to do it. And I, and I made a pact to tell the truth about my life. Not because I think my story is so interesting. It's not. It's because my story is not interesting. It's because it's, you, it, it, it's unique for everyone. Everyone has this story or some version of it. You know, somebody close to them is depressed or has mental illness or, you know, or there is a suicide close to you or somebody's touched by these things somewhere in their lives, I think. And I wanted to do it to inspire people to be able to tell their story, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to just say, it's okay, we can talk about this. Because one of the things that Barbara and I really were so adamant about talking about is that this dialogue needs to happen. We need to talk about mental illness because there's a tremendous stigma around it. There's a tremendous, 
you know, people, and Barbara, you say this so beautifully, because, you know, it used to be, it used to be taboo to talk about AIDS. It used to be taboo to talk about breast cancer. It used to be taboo to talk about al alcoholism. But now it's not. Now we talk about it. But mental illness, it affects all of us, but we don't want to talk about it because it, there's so much shame, there's so much stigma, there's so much icky stuff around it because it's, it touches us in places that are uncomfortable. And I really dove in and thought, I'm gonna get it very uncomfortable. <laughs> and I did, you know, like there, you know, it wasn't like an acting role. It was mm -hmm. like, wow, this is, you can't hide behind this. This is, this is, you either tell the truth or you go home. Well, I mean, a documentary about your life and your family's life, I mean, it's so, you're, you're really stripped raw in a lot of ways. And, yeah. um, you know, you go into some things that I certainly had never heard about before. I won't spoil them here for the people who are going to see it tomorrow. Um, it's tomorrow, I think. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, but I, I would imagine, I mean, I don't know what the journey for you was to get to the point where you felt like you sh this was the right time or the place to reveal these, you know, deep family secrets, but um, was the end result very cathartic? Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> it's, yeah, there's always a shift. I mean, it was a huge shift. Uh, the end result was much more life-changing for me than I had realized it would be, mm -hmm. you know, because I thought I was dealing with this stuff and I knew what mm -hmm. would happen. But because she had such a, an amazing ability to make this story so tangible, I actually go through the story every time I see it. That's why I don't go see it mm -hmm. that often. It's because it, it really brings things up for me. But at the same time, it actually healed it. it. It's like it went full circle and I came out and I went, wow, I'm okay. Mm. You know, I don't have to define myself because my family mm -hmm. is nuts you know? <laughs> <laughs> or has problems. Because mm -hmm. they're also great people, but it doesn't mean that I'm them. Because mm -hmm. there was a time when my sister, uh, at, at, right after my sister killed herself, my sister Margot killed herself that I actually thought it was like passing the baton. I thought, oh my God, I'm her. I thought for some reason that because she'd taken her life, now that all that, all that, all of her problems became my problems or something, like mm -hmm. all of her neuroses or her fears or her whatever, her anxieties in life would become mine. And I, I, I spent a lot of time really struggling mm -hmm. with that. And. Um, you know, I saw the film before Sundance because it premiered mm -hmm. at Sundance mm -hmm. this year, and um, it was it was I was blown away. I mean, Barbara did an amazing job, and there was stuff she didn't show me or tell me that she had. She had 43 hours of uncut, unseen footage right. from a documentary right. that my sister made uh, about our family, and she didn't tell me about it. So I would talk about you know my family. They were in the kitchen at wine time. And they, you know, my mother puts her feet up on the counter and mm -hmm. her feet are in the sink and my sister sits on the other side smoking a cigarette. So I, I think I'm just telling her a story, you know? And I see the movie and she's got footage of them doing that. Yeah, it's uncanny. So it was amazing for me because I thought, it could, part of me is thinking, you know, when you're thinking of your childhood, you think, am I making this up? You know, could my parents really have had a Robin's Egg Blue and bright yellow kitchen? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. Talk about the 80s, in, in and they age, did. Yes. <laughs> so it was really, I mean, it was really great. And now, like, now talking about it, it's like, I just laugh. I, it's, it's like a piece of my life that's kind of that, like, oh, okay. That's, that, now it makes sense why I've been nuts my whole life, <laughs> why I've been, you know, searching. But now I can honestly say I feel pretty good. Mm. And seeing that footage, I mean, and, and not having known that it was going to be in the movie, the first time you saw it, I mean, especially with, with in regards to, to Margot, I don't know, I'd imagine that you, you know, don't spend a lot of time looking up old clips of her, but to see, you know, a deceased sibling sort of younger and seeing these um, almost like home, home movies, um, what, did, what is that experience? What was it? <clears throat> it was I mean, it was... It was crazy because obviously I wasn't there at the time it was being filmed. Um, and Margo was, you know, I guess had a crew in the house, which is odd to me anyway. But he got footage of like my mother, whoever it was, was filming. Well, actually, the guy that did the sound for our movie up in, 
he said to Barbara on the side, he said, I worked on this documentary with that's amazing. Margo. Wow. And that's how that that's she how she said. found this this footage. But it's so like fly on the wall. You know, it's like he's not there. It's like he's somewhere else. Like because my mother was really self-conscious. She never would have like been okay with a camera. She would have bitched about it. <laughs> and she's just there, but he does like or, or Barbara went in close, something. She t chose a shot and she goes in on my mother. This mother that I made up in my mind to be happier and healthier than she was. And she was deeply unhealthy and she was super unhappy. Mm -hmm. And I get, wow, to see her mm -hmm. face. And I was like, wow, she's just not what I made her out to be, mm -hmm. you know, because I loved my mother so much. I wanted her to be okay. Cause she had cancer when I was growing up and I was her primary caregiver. So. This footage is just, I mean, it's so revealing. It's, and, and seeing my sister, that was really powerful because my sister, because um, we had a challenged relationship mm -hmm. for all mm -hmm. those reasons that happened early on in my career. Um, and I was not very kind about her in my, inside. I was like, I was very judgmental. You know, like, why does she drink so much? Mm -hmm. Why does she do all these things? Mm -hmm. And boy, when I saw the film and I saw how much pain she was in, because I could see it, I couldn't see it before. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't, you know, I was a sibling. I just couldn't, mm -hmm. and on film, it was like, wow. She was in very, she was hurting badly. And it, and, and I knew, it made sense why she had committed suicide and I never knew it before. Mm -hmm. I was like, why, why would she? She was so into attention. She was this, she was that. And then I saw how tortured she was the whole time. So that was, it was powerful. Mm. Well, it's an amazing movie. And um, I'm glad that you did it and felt good about doing it. And uh, I'm sure there were hesitations in the beginning, but I'm, it's, uh, it's a nice, document to have out there, especially for also for the work you do with suicide prevention now. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, where do you see yourself? What's next? I know you're doing uh, Mariel's Kitchen. And yeah, I've got a, <coughs> I've got a cookie company. <laughs> My last book was a cookbook. It was a gluten-free, sugar-free cookbook. So I have these cookies called Mariel's Bliskets. And they're sugar-free and they're gluten-free and they're really, really good. And they're, they're so you can get them off MarielsBliskets.com. And, <laughs> and you can get my, oh, and I invite you all to come to my book signing of The Willing Way on um, Saturday at three o'clock somewhere. Does anybody know where? Four o'clock. That, yeah, I lied. That's when I'm getting picked up by the car. Um, <laughs> where is it, sweetie? Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble. So if you want to come, I would love to see you there. I think you'll love the book. It's really nice. It's a kind of it's a kind of nice compliment to the movie. But more importantly, go see Running from Crazy tomorrow night because I think that's pretty awesome. It's a great movie. Yeah. Um, so we can we have time I think for some, for questions, some questions from the audience. If anybody. Yes. I know it's late. I feel the same way. <laughs> what has been your family's reaction to, to the, the to the film? Um, well, my daughter my daughters are in it. My two daughters. 23 and 25, they're in the film. My uh, my cousin, uh, my cousin Hillary, who lives here in Florida, is coming tomorrow. She'll see it for the first time. I'm sure she'll react very well. <laughs> I hope. She's not in it. She right? did. She's not in it. Yeah. She. It no. It showed at Sundance. It's shown at the Cleveland Film Festival. I just came from there. It showed where else? Sun Valley and. And full frame in um, North Carolina, and then it's going to show at Tribeca, and um, so it's it's doing the festival circuit and get it. We are hoping and here and it, we are hoping we're getting a distribution deal. We're actually negotiating that right now. Oh, well, that's true. Because we just want people to see it. I really think it's a good a good thing. But my family, you know, uh, the family that's left, there's been no negative reaction to it because it's not nobody looks bad in the movie it's not about pointing fingers and saying bad things about people it's about really an exploration of feelings mm -hmm. suicide is such a big problem and have I come across anything that I thought would help and you know to deal with it uh, you know I, I, when I talk about lifestyle I really think that those things help you know they might be not a full solution but you know suicide's a whole different tricky subject because it's very specific um, it's it's a mental illness, uh, but it is 
it can happen. It can also happen to somebody who's not manic or something like that. It's very, it's a, it's a horrible thing actually for for survivors to deal with, because we don't we want to blame ourselves. But I can honestly say that, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why we did the film. Talking about it is huge, and being aware if somebody's depressed, you know, to get them help or get them somebody to talk to. But also, that being said, you know, you can't blame yourself either because suicide happens and it's not anybody's fault. It's not even their fault. You know, often people will say it's a selfish, horrible thing for somebody to do. But I can tell you from having suffered depression that when you feel suicidal, you think the world's better off without you. So you don't think you're, you think you're being kind to the world because you, it would be better without you. So it's a, it's a rough one. And one of the things I learned by going to the McLean Institute, which is Harvard Psychiatric Hospital, um, is the, you know, the psychiatric hospital that's attached to Harvard. Um, and it, I went to some suicide groups that which she filmed is that it's, you know, it can be 20 minutes of a bad day for somebody. It can be pl planned for 20 years. It can, it, it, there's so many different variables and it, makes no sense and it especially makes no sense for a parent or a sister or a brother or a, it's just it just moves you because you don't know what to do about it except talk and not feel bad about it and and the the american uh foundation for the for suicide prevention they're a wonderful organization that brings attention to this and we highlighted in the film as well and they're they're wonderful just about getting information out there talking about it they do walks and so it's it's important. It's a, an important thing to talk about. Yeah. <clears throat> Say a little bit about your relationship with your grandfather. Well, sadly, he he died three months before I was born. So <laughs> so I didn't really have a relationship. Yeah, but I do. I have been to Cuba. I've been to a lot of places. I've met a lot of people that have had a drink with him. Um, Key, Key West, I, I would imagine. Everybody, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> of a certain age, everybody's drank with my grandfather um, around the world. People are like, oh, yes, I had a drink with your grandfather. Like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so did everybody. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, you know, I wish I'd had a relationship with him, to be quite honest. And my, gr my father didn't talk about my grandfather very much growing up um, because I think he had a difficult relationship with him himself. So... But he must have loomed large in your family. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to be the son of a, of a, you know, the greatest writer of the 20th century. You know, I mean, I think, and my dad was a writer, not a good, not, not, <laughs> yeah. not a good task to take yeah. up. <laughs> I'm writing self-help. <laughs> <It's really laughs> uh, in the back, yes. Yeah. Um, you said that you went to. Uh, I was making I was making personal best and he played my coach. And so I invited him because I didn't know anybody. <laughs> I didn't know anybody else and he was only the guy, the only guy around. I thought, well, maybe he'll take me. So I, you know. Was he a good date? <laughs> was he a good, was a good date? I, you know, I don't remember. I was nervous. I just remember and I did. I wore like this white dress. I looked like a bride. I had no But it was anti I thought it was so cute. <laughs> Thank you all so yes, very thank much. Thank you for coming.